This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 52. Coming up on Space Time, the possible hidden dimensions inside gravitational waves, the largest virtual universe ever created, and the brightest pulsar ever seen. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. One of the biggest problems string theory, or more correctly M-theory, has over loop quantum gravity is its need for additional dimensions beyond the three spatial and one temporal dimension we see in the space-time around us. Depending on which version of string theory you're into, the universe could have 10, 11, or maybe even 26 dimensions. And that's just for the most popular versions of string theory hypothesis. The problem is finding evidence for these extra dimensions or the supersymmetrical particles associated with them has so far proven to be highly elusive. Undoubtedly, a Nobel Prize in physics awaits. Now, researchers from Germany's Max Planck Institute have theorised that some of these hidden dimensions, if they exist, could influence gravitational waves. Reporting on the prepress physics website archive.org, the authors have hypothesized about the possible consequences these extra dimensions would have on gravitational wave ripples in space-time, and they've predicted whether or not these effects could be detected. One of the study's authors, Dr David Andriot, says the detection of gravitational waves from the merger of two black holes has opened up a new window on the universe. He thinks these new observational tools can not only trace black holes and other exotic astrophysical objects, but they could also help scientists understand gravity itself. There is still a major issue regarding gravity. Is it a real force or simply the effect mass has on the fabric of space-time? Compared to the other three fundamental forces of nature, electromagnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces, gravity is extremely weak. And the authors think the reason for this weakness could be that gravity interacts with more than the four dimensions that are part of our everyday experience. These extra dimensions are hidden because they're very small, but they're an indispensable part of string theory, one of the promising candidates for a theory of quantum gravity. A theory of quantum gravity would unify quantum mechanics, the study of the universe on the smallest of scales, and general relativity, the study of the universe on the cosmic scale. It's important for helping scientists understand what happens with very large masses at very small distances. For example, inside a black hole or at the Big Bang. The study's other author, Dr. Gustavo Luciana Gomez, says physicists have been searching for extra dimensions in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, but so far the search has yielded no results. Gomez thinks gravitational wave detectors may be able to provide that experimental evidence. The authors discovered that the extra dimensions they're looking for should have two different effects on gravitational waves. They would modify the standard gravitational wave and would cause additional waves at higher frequencies above 1000 Hz. However, the observation of the latter is unlikely. That's because the existing ground-based gravitational wave detectors, LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatories, located in Louisiana and Washington state, simply aren't sensitive enough at high frequencies. On the other hand, the effect that extra dimensions can make on how standard gravitational waves stretch and shrink space-time might be easier to detect by making use of more than one detector. And that's where the new European Virgo detector comes in. Virgo will join the two LIGO gravitational wave detectors for the next observing run slated for either late 2018 or early 2019. We'll keep you informed. Right now, there are two primary theories in the running to explain quantum gravity. Loop quantum gravity was born out of Albert Einstein's general relativity theory, and it makes testable scientific predictions which so far can't be made by string theory. It basically predicts that space-time is composed of discrete quantized units of space-time because of general relativity's linking of gravity and the geometry of space-time. In its simplest terms, loop quantum gravity says space-time comes in small Planck-sized chunks. Low-energy versions of loop quantum gravity contain force-carrying particles called gravitons, which are predicted in the standard model of particle physics. And importantly, two masses placed within loop quantum gravity equations will attract each other in line with Newton's law of gravity. Loop quantum gravity also demonstrates the entropy of a black hole, making predictions in line with Hawking radiation. However, in spite of all its good points, loop quantum gravity also has its problems. For example, instead of an infinite singularity inside a black hole, 
Quantum theory predicts there'd only be so much space available inside a black hole. Still, supporters of loop quantum gravity believe that by fine-tuning Hawking radiation, they could resolve these issues. It's possible that instead of falling onto the surface of a singularity in a black hole, matter falling into the black hole actually expands out into a different region of space-time. And that's interesting because that could eliminate the need for a singularity in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, instead providing a model for an eternal universe. On the other hand, string theory predicts multiverses by expanding everything into high-dimensional space-times. It not only tries to create a quantum theory of gravity, but it also tries to unify gravity with the other three forces through these additional dimensions. Basically, string theory tells us that particles are made up of individual strings or filaments of energy, and these energy strings each vibrate at different frequencies, giving you the different elemental particles. The strings only have one dimension, length, but they come in two forms, open strings, whose ends don't touch, and closed strings, whose ends are connected with each other, forming a loop. According to the theory, strings can undergo five basic types of interactions. And this is important because only strings capable of being closed work in string theory. And they're interesting to physicists because they have properties which could possibly be describing gravity. As string theory evolved, scientists realized that also needed other features like sheets or membranes in order to work. The strings can then be attached by one or both ends to these sheets, forming two-dimensional membranes. Supporters believe string theory can unify the four forces of nature under the extreme high energy conditions of the early universe through strings interacting with each other. The universe is made up of two types of elemental particles. Bosons, such as photons, gluons, W and Z bosons, the Higgs boson, and if it exists, the graviton. They all have integer spin and they're all force carriers. The other type of elemental particle in the universe is the fermion, Fermions are particles of matter, such as electrons, quarks and neutrinos. They're the things atoms and molecules are built out of. And this is where supersymmetry comes into the picture, because according to string theory, for every fermion that exists, there must be a matching boson, and vice versa. The problem is, scientists haven't been able to detect these extra particles. So supersymmetry was invented to provide the mathematical relationship between some of the elements in physical equations, in the process simplifying string theory equations and removing a whole bunch of inconsistencies. But once again, the problem with these supersymmetrical particles, just like the extra dimensions, is they haven't been found. String theorists now believe they may only have existed under the extremely high energy conditions of the very early universe, and therefore we haven't built particle accelerators strong enough to detect them. The extra dimensions we're talking about in this story are another mathematical result of string theory. These extra dimensions would be all curled up into tiny sizes. They can't be perceived because we're in the three-dimensional membrane and these extra dimensions extend off it, possibly into other parts of the multiverse. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Scientists at the University of Zurich have simulated the formation of the universe using a supercomputer. The gigantic catalogue of some 25 billion virtual galaxies has been generated in preparation for the European Euclid mission, which will launch in 2020 to study dark matter and dark energy. The catalogue will be used to help calibrate experiments on board the Euclid satellite. Over a period of three years, astrophysicists have developed and optimized a revolutionary new computer code designed to describe in unprecedented detail and accuracy the dynamics of dark matter and the formation of large-scale structures across the universe. The code was then allowed to run for just 80 hours. During that time, it generated a virtual universe of some 2 trillion macro particles, representing the dark matter fluid from which a catalogue of some 25 billion virtual galaxies was extracted. This dark matter fluid was allowed to evolve under its own gravity. It simulated the formation of small concentrations of matter called dark matter halos in which galaxies, including our own Milky Way, are thought to have formed. The challenge of this simulation was to model galaxies as small as a tenth the size of the Milky Way in a volume of space as large as the entire observable universe. This was the primary requirement set out by the European Euclid mission, whose main objective is to explore the dark side of the universe. In fact, some 95% of the universe is dark. The cosmos consists of 23% dark matter and 72% dark energy. 
The problem is, the nature of both dark energy and dark matter remain two of the biggest unsolved puzzles in modern science. Euclid works by capturing the light from billions of galaxies across large areas of the sky. Astronomers will then measure the subtle distortions that arise from the deflection of light from these background galaxies by the invisible foreground distribution of mass in the form of dark matter. The new Virtual Galaxy Catalogue should help astronomers optimise the observational strategy of the Euclid experiment. This should help reduce sources for possible error before the satellite embarks on its six-year data-collecting mission. From the Euclid data, researchers hope to obtain new information about the nature of dark matter and dark energy, and hopefully discover new physics beyond the standard model, such as a modified version of general relativity, or maybe even new types of particles, such as those expected under supersymmetry. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a new candidate for the brightest pulsar ever found. The newly discovered pulsar record holder, called NGC 5907ULX, is located some 50 million light years away, making it also the most distant pulsar ever seen. A report in the journal Science claims it emits as much energy in a second as our Sun does in three and a half years. And astronomers are still trying to work out just how it could be shining so brightly. The object's now part of a small group of mysterious pulsars, which are challenging astronomers to rethink how pulsars can accumulate and accrete material. Pulsars are neutron stars, the highly compacted stellar corpses of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have gone supernova at the end of their life cycles on the main sequence. Main sequence is that part of a star's life when it's fusing hydrogen in its core into helium, the process which makes stars shine. Neutron stars generate beams of energy which shine over vast distances across the universe. And as the star rotates, these beams appear to pulsate, hence the name pulsar. And if aligned well enough with Earth, these beams act like lighthouse beacons, appearing to flash on and off as the pulsar rotates. The newly discovered pulsar was detected simultaneously by the European Space Agency's XMM-Newton X-ray Space Telescope and NASA's Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array spacecraft NUSTAR. The study's lead author, Gianluca Israel from the Rome Astronomical Observatory, says the pulsar is challenging science's current understanding of the accretion process for high-luminosity neutron stars. In fact, this pulsar is around a thousand times more luminous than the maximum thought possible for an accreting neutron star. It means something else is needed in our models in order to account for the enormous amounts of energy being released by this object. The new discovery absolutely towers over the previous record holder for the brightest pulsar. That was M82X2, which was discovered by a new star in October 2014 in the cigar galaxy Messier 82 at a distance of some 12 million light years. In simple terms, the newly discovered pulsar is some 10 times brighter. Another extremely bright pulsar, in fact the third brightest ever known, is NGC 7793P13. It was detected in October 2016 using both new star and XMM Newton. Scientists are calling these three extremely bright pulsars ultraluminous X-ray sources. Before the 2014 pulsar discovery, scientists thought the brightest ultraluminous X-ray sources were probably black holes. In fact, we find these things are brighter than what you'd normally expect to find from an accreting black hole ten times the mass of our Sun. How these objects are able to shine so brightly is a mystery. The leading theory is that these pulsars have very strong complex magnetic fields very close to their surfaces. The magnetic field will then distort the flow of incoming material close to the neutron star surface. This in turn could allow the neutron star to continue accreting material while at the same time generating high levels of brightness. The discovery also means there are probably many more neutron stars out there which actually qualify as ultraluminous X-ray sources. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary.
And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for July on Skywatch. July is the seventh month of the year, both in the Julian and Gregorian calendars. It's actually named after the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar, who was born in that month. Prior to that, it was called Quintilis, which is simply Latin for fifth. On average, July is the coldest month of the year in the Southern Hemisphere, which sort of makes sense because we're experiencing winter right now. Also, it marks the time in the year when Earth's at aphelion, its furthest orbital position from the Sun. Of course, in reality, temperatures, or more accurately seasons on Earth, aren't dictated by the distance from the Sun, but rather the length of the day, and hence the amount of sunlight any given part of the Earth receives. And that's all governed by the tilt of Earth's axis. Consequently, that's why, although it's the coldest month in the Southern Hemisphere, July is also on average the warmest month in the Northern Hemisphere, which is experiencing summer right now. During aphelion, Earth is about 152.1 million kilometres from the Sun. That's a difference of only about 3%, or about 5 million kilometres further away than during perihelion, when Earth's about 147.1 million kilometres from the Sun. This year, aphelion occurs at 2011 GMT, or Greenwich Mean Time, on July 4th, American Independence Day. That's 6.11 in the morning Australian Eastern Standard Time on July the 5th. As for perihelion, it takes place on January 3rd. But over cosmic time, these dates will change due to variations in its orbit, such as eccentricity, axial tilt and precession, all of which follow regular cyclic patterns known as Milankovit cycles. Eccentricity involves changes in how elliptical Earth's orbit around the Sun is. None of the planets orbit the Sun in circular orbits, although Venus and Neptune are pretty close. All planets have elongated orbits around the Sun, and they all vary slightly over time. Earth also spins on its axis, which is currently inclined at 23.4 degrees compared to the ecliptic, that's Earth's orbital plane around the Sun. But this angle of tilt changes over time, influenced by, among other things, the distribution of mass within the Earth itself. And like a spinning top, Earth's rotational axis also changes orientation through a process called precession, changing its position in relation to fixed background stars over a 26,000 year cycle. All these effects impact on the amount of solar radiation reaching the Earth and consequently the planet's seasonal and climatic patterns. The anomalistic year, which is measured from perihelion to perihelion, is approximately 25 minutes longer than the tropical year, which is measured from equinox to equinox and upon which our calendar system is based. All this means roughly every 58 years, perihelion and aphelion regress or move forward by a calendar day. And in case you were wondering, perihelion and aphelion move all the way around the calendar in about 21,000 years. OK, now let's turn to the stars. The Southern Cross is at its highest point in the southern sky this time of the year and is pointing directly to the celestial south pole. The Southern Cross is within the constellation of Centaurus, the centaur, the half-human, half-horse of Greek mythology. The creature appears in the sky holding a bow loaded with an arrow. The centaur's front leg is marked by the two pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centaurus. At 4.3 light years, Alpha Centauri, the second of the two pointer stars from the Southern Cross, is also the nearest star system to the Sun. The centaur's back arches over the Southern Cross, and just above this is Omega Centauri, a spectacular globular cluster, visible with the unaided eye from dark locations. Globular clusters are tightly packed spheres containing thousands to millions of stars, which were originally all born at the same time in the same molecular gas and dust cloud. Omega Centauri is about 16,000 light years from Earth. It's one of the largest and brightest of the hundreds of globular clusters known to orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. Centaurus was included among 48 constellations listed by the 2nd century astronomer Ptolemy, and it remains one of the 88 modern day constellations. OK, turning now to the right or west, we find the constellation of Leo the Lion just above the western horizon. Its brightest star, Regulus, or Little King, is located 79 light years away. Regulus, designated Alpha Leonis, is actually a five star system organised into two sets. Regulus A is a spectroscopic binary comprising a spectral type B blue white main sequence star, four times the mass and some 288 times the luminosity of the Sun. And there's a faint companion as well, which is thought to be a white dwarf, the stellar corpse of a Sun like star. Spectroscopic binaries are stars that can't be resolved by optical telescopes into two separate objects and can only really be separated by observing their spectroscopic Doppler shift as they orbit around each other. Located further away are Regulus B, C and D, which are dim main sequence stars. At the opposite end of the constellation from Regulus is the star Beta Leonis, or Dinobola, the horse's tail. It's also a luminous blue-white star, 
thought to be a spectral type A, about half as bright as Regulus and the third brightest star within the Leo constellation. Beta Leonis is about 1.8 times the mass of the Sun and has about 15 times the Sun's luminosity. It's suspected of being a dwarf Cepheid or Delta Scuti type variable star, meaning its luminosity varies very slightly over several hours due to pulsations on the stellar surface. Algebra or Gamma Leonis is a binary star system with a visible third component. The two primary stars are located about 126 light years away and can be resolved in small backyard telescopes. Both are yellow gold giants orbiting each other roughly every 600 Earth days. The unrelated tertiary star named 40 Leonis is a yellow tinged star which can be seen through binoculars. Gamma Leonis' traditional name of Algebra means the forehead. Next we come to Delta Leonis or Zosma, a blue-white star some 58 light years from the Sun. Then there's Epsilon Leonis, a yellow giant some 251 light years from the Earth. Also in Leo is Zeta Leonis, an optical triple star system. The brightest component is a white giant 260 light years from the Earth, while the second brightest star 39 Leonis is widely spaced and located to the south of the primary, with a third fainter star in the system 35 Leonis located further to the north. Loto Leonis is also a binary star system, divisible in medium-sized backyard telescopes. Located some 79 light years away, Loto Leonis appears to be a yellow tinged star, with the two components orbiting each other every 183 Earth years. Finally in Leo, let's look at Tau Leonis. Visible as a double star through binoculars, it includes a yellow giant located some 621 light years from Earth and a binary secondary star 54 Leonis, actually a pair of blue-white stars that are visible in small telescopes and located some 289 light years from Earth. Leo also contains many galaxies, including the spiral galaxy Messier 66, as well as Messier 65 and NGC 3628, the three of which combine to be known as the Leo triplet. Located some 37 million light years away, the Leo triplet has a somewhat distorted shape. That's due to gravitational interactions between Messier 66 and the two other galaxies, which are cannibalizing stars from Messier 66. Eventually, the outermost stars may form a dwarf galaxy orbiting M66. Both M65 and M66 are visible in large binoculars and small backyard telescopes, but their concentrated nuclei and elongation are only visible using larger instruments. Other bright, well-known galaxies in LEO include Messier 95, Messier 96, Messier 105 and NGC 3628. M95 and M96 are both spiral galaxies, each about 20 million light-years from the Earth. Both look like nothing more than fuzzy objects in small telescopes, but show off their spectacular structures in larger instruments. As for M95, it's a barred spiral, identified by its more elongated central regions. Another barred spiral in GC 2903 is thought to be both similar in size and structure to our own Milky Way galaxy. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1784. Close to the M95 M96 pair is the elliptical galaxy M105, which is also about 20 million light years from Earth. The constellation also includes the Leo ring, a vast cloud of hydrogen and helium gas orbiting two of the galaxies within the constellation. A gravitationally lensed object known as the Cosmic Horseshoe is also found in Leo. Moving above Leo now, we find the constellation Virgo, who in Greek and Roman mythology was the goddess of wheat and agriculture. Virgo's brightest star, Spica, is visible above the western horizon. It's located about 250 light years away. Spica is Latin for the ear of wheat, which Virgo is holding in her hand. Spica, or Alpha Virginis, is the 16th brightest star in the night sky and is both a spectroscopic binary and a rotating ellipsoidal variable, a close binary system whose stars are not eclipsing but cause apparent fluctuations in brightness because of changes in the amount of light-emitting area visible to the observer. Spica's two main stars orbit each other every four Earth days and are so close they're egg-shaped rather than being spherical because of the gravitational attraction they have for each other. And that's also why they can only be separated as two individual objects by their spectra. The primary is a blue giant variable Beta Cepheid star, which undergoes small rapid variations in brightness because of pulsations on the star's surface, thought to be caused by the unusual properties of iron at temperatures above 200,000 degrees in the stellar interior. It is about 10 times the mass of the Sun and about 7 times its diameter. The secondary star in the system is somewhat smaller than the primary, but still some 7 times the mass of our Sun and some 3.6 times its diameter. Let's turn now to the north and the constellation Bootes the Herdsman. 
There you'll see the bright orange red star Arcturus, or Alpha Bootes, just above the northern horizon. It's a red giant, just 37 light years away, a bloated ageing star, some 7.1 billion years old, nearing the end of its life. Although not much more massive than the Sun, it's expanded out to some 25 times the Sun's diameter and will soon puff off its outer gaseous envelope as a planetary nebula, revealing its white-hot stellar core, a white dwarf which will slowly cool over the eons of time. Arcturus, therefore, provides us with a glimpse of what our own Sun's ultimate fate is likely to be. Another bright reddish star, this time in the east, is the red supergiant Antares, meaning the rival of Mars because of its appearance and location in the sky, which appears to be the opposite of Mars in the sky. Antares is one of the biggest known stars in the universe. In fact, it's enormous, some 18 times the Sun's mass, 10,000 times its luminosity, and a massive 883 times the Sun's radius. Now, as we mentioned in last month's Skywatch, were Antares placed at the centre of our solar system, its surface would extend close to the orbit of Jupiter. Despite being some 550 light years away, Antares is still the 15th brightest star in the night sky. Unlike the Sun or Arcturus, the death of Antares will be a far more spectacular event. You see, Antares is destined to explode as a core collapse or type 2 supernova. When it does so, sometime in the next few hundred thousand years, it'll appear as bright in the Earth's sky as the full moon and will be quite strongly visible even in daytime. Antares has a companion star, Antares B, a spectral type B blue-white main sequence star more than seven times the Sun's mass and about five times its diameter. Antares is also known as the heart of the Scorpion in the constellation Scorpius. I mention that because below Scorpius is the constellation Sagittarius, the Archer, which points the way to the galactic centre of the Milky Way galaxy. Sagittarius is commonly represented as a wing centaur, pulling back a bow aimed directly at Antares, the heart of the Scorpion Scorpius. The centre of the Milky Way galaxy and its supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star lie in the westernmost part of the constellation Sagittarius. Sagittarius A star is located 27,000 light years away and has some 4.3 million times the mass of our Sun. Turning to the stars in Sagittarius, and we find Alpha Sagittarii, or Rukbat, meaning the Archer's Knee. It's a spectral type B blue star. Located some 182 light years away, it's some 2.5 times the diameter of the Sun, and about 40 times as luminous. Astronomers think it's surrounded by a dense debris disk and a newborn companion star, which is only just now joining the main sequence. The brightest star in Sagittarius is Epsilon Sagittarii, or Claus Australis, the southern part of the bow. Epsilon Sagittarii is a binary system located 143 light years from Earth. The primary star is an evolved spectral type B blue giant at the end of its life on the main sequence. It contains about 3.5 times the mass of the Sun, almost 7 times the Sun's radius, and is radiating around 396 times the Sun's luminosity. It's also a strong X-ray source, and is spinning very rapidly with an estimated radial velocity of some 236 km per second. The system also displays an excess of infrared radiation emissions, all of which suggests the presence of a circumstellar disk of dust. The second star in the system appears to be deep inside this debris disk. Astronomers think it's a spectral type G yellow dwarf star, about 95% the mass of our Sun. Next we turn to Sigma Sagittarii, or Nunki, the constellation's second brightest star. The name Nunki is Babylonian, however its exact meaning is unknown. It's thought to represent the ancient Babylonian sacred city of Urdu on the Euphrates River. This would make Nanku the oldest known star name currently in use. It's a spectral type B blue star located some 260 light years from Earth. It's about 8 times the Sun's mass, about 4.5 times its radius, and it has about 3,300 times the luminosity of our Sun. Next we come to Zeta Sagittarii, or Eskela, the armpit. It's a binary star system about 88 light years from the Sun. Interestingly, it's currently speeding away from the solar system, and it may have been as near as 1.5 light years from the Sun about 1.4 million years ago, making it a former extremely close neighbour, certainly much closer than the Alpha Centauri system, which as we said earlier is 4.3 light years away. One of the stars in the Zeta Sagittarius system is a spectral type A white giant, while the others a spectral type A white supergiant, the pair orbiting each other every 21 Earth years. The system's combined mass is about 5.26 times the mass of our Sun. Next we come to Delta Sagittarii, or Caus Meridionalis. It appears to be a double star system, located some 348 light-years from the Earth and is listed as an orange giant. 
Next is Eta Sagittarii, a double star system located about 146 light years from Earth. The primary star is an aging bloated red giant on the asymptotic giant branch. That means it's no longer fusing hydrogen or helium in its core, as instead fusing much heavier elements while undergoing shell burning of both hydrogen and helium in successive layers. Eta Sagittarii has already expanded to some 57 times the radius of the Sun and is now very near the end of its life. The second star in the system is a spectral type F main sequence white yellow dwarf star, which appears to be in a binary system with a primary star, orbiting it every 1,270 Earth years. Next we come to Pi Sagittarii, a triple star system located some 510 light years away. The primary star in the system appears to be a spectral type F yellow giant, which has exhausted its core hydrogen fuel and is now off the main sequence and evolving into a red giant. Pi Sagittarii has two nearby companions, about which little is known. Next we come to Beta Sagittarii, or ARCAB, the Achilles tendon. It's actually a designation shared by two completely separate star systems, one about 378 light years from the Earth, the other just 139 light years away. Beta Sagittarii A is a spectral type B blue dwarf star, while Beta Sagittarii B is a white yellow giant. Lying near the very centre of the constellation is Nova Sagittarii, which was only discovered in 2015. As its name suggests, it's a nova, a white dwarf star in a binary system with another star, which is constantly drawing material off its companion star. Once enough material has been accreted onto the surface of the white dwarf, the pressure from all this added mass undergoes a thermonuclear explosion, causing the star to suddenly light up like a beacon and then slowly fade over the following weeks or months. Now this blast isn't strong enough to destroy the white dwarf, only the additional material that it's picked up. And once this additional mass is burnt off, the same cycle starts over again, and the process repeats itself on timescales ranging from every few years to tens of thousands of years apart. The Sagittarius constellation also hosts many star clusters and nebulae, including some of the best known astronomical objects in the sky. These include the Lagoon Nebula, Messier 8, a spectacular pink emission nebula located about 5,000 light years from the Earth, which measures some 140 light years by 60 light years across. The central area of the Lagoon Nebula is also known as the Hourglass Nebula. That's because of its distinctive shape caused by matter being propelled by a massive star forming region known as Herschel 36. It's one of the few star forming regions that it's possible to see with the unaided eye. The Lagoon Nebula was instrumental in the discovery of Bok globules, more than 17,000 of which have so far been found in the nebula. Bok globules contain embryonic protostars destined to eventually become new stellar generations. Another spectacular sight in Sagittarius is Messier 17, better known as the Horsehead Nebula. Located some 4,890 light years from the Earth, it's a dense region of ionized atomic hydrogen. Also known as the Omega or Swan Nebula or the chess piece, it spans some 15 light years in diameter and has some 800 times the mass of our Sun. In fact, it's considered one of the brightest and most massive star forming regions in our galaxy, with a geometry very similar to the Orion Nebula, except that it's being viewed edge on rather than face on. The open star cluster NGC 6618 lies embedded in the nebulosity. It causes gases in the nebula to shine due to the intense radiation from these hot young stars. The nebula is thought to contain more than 800 stars, including over 100 of the very largest and most massive spectral type O and B blue stars. Astronomers think more than 1,000 additional stars are also being formed in the surrounding molecular gas and dust clouds. It's also one of the youngest known clusters in the galaxy, with an age of just over a million years. The cloud of interstellar material forming the nebula is roughly 40 light years in diameter and contains some 30,000 solar masses. Next, we turn to the Trifid Nebula, Messier 20. It's another large star forming emission nebula containing many young hot stars. Located between 2,000 and 9,000 light years from the Earth, the Trifid Nebula has a diameter of approximately 50 light years. The outside is a bluish reflection nebula, while the inner regions are glowing pink thanks to ionized hydrogen. There are two dark bands dividing the Trifid Nebula into three regions or lobes. The hydrogen in the nebula is being ionized by a central triple star system, which formed at the intersection of the two dark bands, creating its characteristic pink color. Another star forming region, NGC 6559, located some 5,000 light years from the Earth, also contains both red emission and blue reflection regions. The grouping of the Lagoon Nebula, the Trifid Nebula, and NGC 6559 is collectively known as the Sagittarius Triplet. 
Next, we move to a spectacular planetary nebula some 8,000 light years from Earth, the Red Spider Nebula, NGC 6537. It's well worth a look through a telescope. It has a spectacular two lobed shape. The central white dwarf, the remnant of the original star, produces a 10,000 degree hot stellar wind moving at some 3,000 kilometres per second. This wind's generating 1,000 billion kilometre high waves as a result of supersonic shocks formed as the local gas is being compressed and heated in front of the rapidly expanding lobes. The lobes are possibly due to a binary companion star or maybe magnetic fields. They have a characteristic S-shaped symmetry about them, with the lobes opposite each other appearing similar. Atoms caught in the shocks are radiating invisible light, giving the nebula its unique spider-like shape and also contributing to its expansion. The star at the centre of the red spider nebula is surrounded by a dust shell. That's making its exact properties hard to determine. Its surface temperature is thought to be a scorching 250,000 degrees, although a temperature of up to 500,000 degrees can't be ruled out. Either way, it makes this among the hottest white dwarf stars known. We also have three meteor showers peaking in July. The Delta Acarids are visible from mid-July to mid-August each year, with peaks occurring around July the 28th and 29th. The showers thought of originated from the breakup of the comet 69P Macaults. The Delta Acarids get their name because their radiant, the place where the meteoroids appear to be coming from, appears to lie in the constellation Aquarius, near one of the constellation's brightest stars, Delta Aquarii. There are two branches to the Delta Acrid meteor shower, southern and northern. The southern Delta Acrids are considered the strongest shower, with an average of between 15 and 20 meteors an hour between midnight and dawn. Listeners in the southern hemisphere usually get the best show because the radiant is higher in the southern sky. Since the radiance above the southern horizon, for northern hemisphere listeners, the meteors will seem to fan out in all directions east, north and west, but there will be few meteors seen heading southwards. That's unless they're very short and near the radiant. In contrast, the northern delta acroids are the weaker shower, peaking usually later in mid-August, with an average peak rate of about 10 meteors an hour. The third meteor shower for July is the nearby slow and bright Alpha Capricornids. It begins as early as July the 15th and continues until around August the 10th. This meteor shower has infrequent but relatively bright meteors and some fireballs. It's generated as Earth passes through the debris trail left behind by the comet 169P NEAT, which was originally identified as an asteroid, 2002 EX12. However, further observations showed that this asteroid was actually weakly active during perihelion and was thus reclassified as a comet. The meteor showers thought to have been created between 3,500 and 5,000 years ago, when about half of the parent body disintegrated and fell into dust. Over time, the dust cloud evolved into Earth's orbit, causing a shower with peak rates of about 5 meteors an hour, with some outbursts of bright flaring meteors radiating out of the constellation Capricorn towards the south. Interestingly, the bulk of this comet's debris won't be in Earth's orbital path until the 24th century, by which time the Alpha Capricornoids are expected to become a major annual meteor storm, stronger than any current annual shower. Joining me now is Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, to continue our tour of the July night skies. All right, good day, Stuart. Well, let's start with the view to the south. For those of us in the southern hemisphere, the Southern Cross is nice and high in the south, standing almost upright during the sort of early and middle part of the evening. You can't miss it. Just look down the south, about two-thirds of the way up in the sky, and there's the Southern Cross. People are a bit surprised, actually. They think, they think it's going to be really huge, but it's actually quite small. It's, it's actually the smallest... The, yeah, yeah, smallest constellation in the sky in terms of area that it covers and it looks like a kite they call it the southern cross it's not a cross like a plus sign on your keyboard it's a cross like a crucifix the correct name for the constellation actually is crooks which means crucifix so it, it's sort of a kite shaped thing quite small about two-thirds of the way up in the sky down the south now just across to its left not very far across to its left are two bright stars and they're known as the two pointers because if you draw a line through them it points towards the southern cross and the pointer on the left hand side is the famous alpha centauri which is the star system close closest to our solar system, just over four light years away. Now, Alpha Centauri is actually a double star, and there's a third very small star nearby called Proxima Centauri that many astronomers think is also part of the system, which would make it a triple star system. And triple star systems do exist out there. There are quadruple star systems and quintuple systems. There's even stars that have six, or systems that have six stars going around each other. Yeah, our sun's a bit of a, uh, a loner like that, isn't it? It's unusual. Yeah. It's an outlier being just yeah, a single it, star. Yeah, it, it's a loner. It's, it's all on its own. I mean, there are plenty, plenty of stars out there on their own but a lot of them come as doubles or triples as well yeah so the Milky Way which is 
is um, our galaxy seen from the inside is stretching across the sky from the northeast to the southwest in the uh, early evening and mid evening by midnight when the earth has turned a bit more on its axis the milky way will be lined up beautifully more or less straight north south now high in the northwestern part of the sky you'll see a bright light which is the planet jupiter and you can't miss it because it's really the brightest thing around that part of the sky. It's so spectacular right now. It's really, really good. Not far from it, you'll see another uh, bright light, which is actually a star called Spica. Not as bright as Jupiter, a bit dimmer, but still quite bright as stars go. Spica, it's called, and it's the brightest star in the constellation Virgo. Now, Jupiter itself, of course, is the largest of the planets in our solar system, and it has lots of moons, 69 of them at the last count. A few of them are big enough to be spotted through binoculars. So if you have a pair of 7x50s or bigger, Get them out and take a look. You'll see between one and four moons, depending on where they are. Sometimes they're in, they might be in front of the planet or behind and you can't see them, or they might be spread out on either side. Sometimes you might see four on one side or two this side and two the other side or one and three or whatever. They just look like tiny, tiny pinpricks of light next to this bright blob of light, which is um, the planet Jupiter itself. Now, our solar system's other giant planet, Saturn, is pretty close to being directly overhead at the moment from the latitude of Sydney, at least, in Australia, during the mid-evening time uh, of July. Now, it has lots of moons, too. 62 is the current count. But you'll need more than binoculars, I'm afraid, to get a good look at Saturn or even a glimpse of, the, of its biggest moons because Saturn's smaller and it's further away and, of course, its moons are further away. So you're going to need a telescope. If you don't have one yourself, find someone who does and ask them to give you a look because everybody loves the view of Saturn through a telescope. It's one those ooh-ah sort of moments when you first see it. It really is quite specky. Are telescopes wasted in a city like Sydney where there's so much light pollution at night? No, they're not wasted if, if you're, depending on what you're looking for. If you're looking for planets and things, they're perfectly fine. Uh, I mean, what you're getting at there, of course, is because of all the, the lights uh, shining up into the sky. I mean, lights are supposed to be directed down onto the ground <laughs> at night time so we can see where we're walking or driving or whatever. But a lot of the light escapes and it goes straight upwards. And it just makes the sky glow. So instead of the sky being a beautiful pitch black darkness, it's a, a sort of a dull grey colour, particularly if you've got a lot of pollution and stuff or dust in the air as well. So faint things, like some of the faint nebulas and, and galaxies and things, you're going to have trouble seeing, and that's why people get bigger and bigger telescopes to try and drag more and more light in. You can also get some special filters to put uh, over your telescope to cut out the sky glow, because that, the, gl the sky glows at a certain wavelength of light, and you can put a filter on the front to um, cut out some of that stuff. Not 100% perfect, but it certainly is better than nothing. But in terms of looking at the planets, and in the case of Saturn, its moons, and Jupiter, its moons, perfectly fine, yeah. Even a small telescope's great. It, you know, even the smallest telescope is, is good enough to get a, you know, at least a glimpse of... You'll see Saturn with its rings. Won't be won't be huge, uh, but it'll be good. And, and Jupiter, you'll be able to see J the planet as a disk, small disk, and you might even be able to make out some sort of broad detail in its cloud bands. And you, you'll certainly be able to spot some of these little moons. And again, they don't look like the pictures in books. They just look like tiny tiny pinpricks of light. But when you consider that you're looking over hundreds of millions of kilometres of empty space, they're so far away, just to even be able to see them through a small telescope is pretty pretty amazing. If you're having trouble um, picking out Saturn, spotting which one is Saturn from amongst all the stars, go out and take a look on the evening of July the 7th because the moon will be just a few degrees away from Saturn. Uh, so look for the moon and then just find the nearest bright star, the star in inverted commas, uh, and that'll be Saturn. Similarly, if you're having trouble spotting Jupiter, and you really shouldn't be because it's the biggest, brightest thing out in the northwestern part of the sky in the evening. Well, wait until July the 30th, and you'll see the moon will be right close to it, just like it was with Saturn. So that's a really good way to find the planets, because the moon, during its course of its orbit around the Earth, more or less goes along the same line in the sky that the planets do. So it usually pops along, and every now and then it, it'll be right next to one of the planets. You've just got to wait for long enough. And this is called the ecliptic. The ecliptic, yeah, that's called the ecliptic. It's um, it's the plane, uh, the flat plane in which the uh, the planets go around out the sun. Some of them are a little bit above the plane, and some a little bit below, but more or less they're all in the same uh, flat plane. Now, if you're an early riser and you're up and around about 6 a.m., you'll find the Milky Way is gone. It's disappeared. It's, it's dropped below the western horizon as the Earth has turned. Jupiter and Saturn have gone as well. They've also dropped below the western horizon as the Earth has turned on its axis, shining brightly out there in the, in the northeast. Um, beautiful. Venus. Venus. Big, 
amazing big bright white light currently known as the morning star. It's not a star, it's a planet, but it's known as the morning star because it looks like a star. And just around to Venus's right, you'll find the distinctive star patterns of the constellation Orion, the hunter, which is after the Southern Cross and a couple of others, is probably the biggest and most amazing, easily recognisable constellation in the sky. You can't miss it. It's got three little stars in a line, which is the, the belt part of the Orion, the hunter, the man. And just a little bit to the east of that, Lower in the sky, you'll see another big bright white light, and that's the star Sirius. Now, Sirius is the brightest star in our night sky, and when we say brightest, we mean that in the sense of what astronomers call apparent magnitude, which is how bright something looks in our sky with our naked eye at whatever our distance is from it, whether it's a planet or a star. We get a lot of questions about apparent magnitude. Yeah, yeah, well, let's take Sirius as, a, um, as an example. Okay, so we say that it's the brightest star in the night sky. That's according to what we call apparent magnitude. That's just how it looks with no changes, no telescopes or anything like that. It's just how bright it is compared to the other stars. That's as distinct from what's called absolute magnitude, which is how bright things would appear at a standard distance from us. So even though Sirius, for instance, it appears to be the brightest star in the night sky, there are other stars out there in our galaxy that are far brighter than Sirius, but they're a lot further away. So to us, they seem to be dimmer and fainter and, and smaller. So that's the difference between apparent magnitude and absolute. Apparent magnitude is just how it appears to be, apparent, appear. Absolute magnitude is how things would appear to be if they were all at the same distance from us, a standard distance. Amateur astronomers tend to use apparent magnitude uh, numbers when talking about what they're seeing in the night sky. When uh, professional astronomers are doing their physics and astrophysics and stuff, they're generally talking about absolute magnitude, what the intrinsic brightness of something is. So as I say, Sirius is nice and bright, apparently, in our sky, but there are plenty of stars out there that are far brighter than it, but they're further away, so they appear dimmer. And similarly, you know, you can have stars that are quite close to us, but it's not very bright intrinsically, doesn't have a very high absolute magnitude but because it's close to us it might appear brighter than ones other ones that are further away but are brighter so um yeah and there's a scale really... for all these things isn't there both pluses and minuses Ma magnitude yeah, yeah yeah so um sirius i think is minus 1.3 or 1 1.5 or something like that venus at the moment is probably about minus 4 4.3 something like that i'm just taking those numbers off the top of my head that's what they usually are and the so the brighter ones go into the negatives so zero is a sort of a, a central brightness and anything that goes in like minus one, minus two, minus three, they're very, very bright. And the plus side of that uh, equation, if you've got a star that's um, plus four magnitude, then it's pretty dim. Plus five is usually about as dim as you can see from ordinary locations. If you get out into really, really dark skies where there's no light pollution around and you've got good eyesight, which I don't have anymore, you can get down a little bit below plus five, between plus five and plus six. If you've got good clear air, the night is nice and steady and no light pollution around. So if you're out in the outback or a desert area or something like that, surprisingly, you'd think being out on the ocean would be uh, pretty good and you'd be able to, you know, you're a long way from lights and things. I've actually found the few times I've been out on ship, it's not that good because a, you've got the lights of the ships annoying you, or the ship that you're on, but also there seems to be a lot of sea spray in the air. Okay. And, and, and that tends to uh, muck things up a little bit. I remember back in 1986, I went out on a cruise ship to look at Comet Halley, and yeah, it wasn't, it was okay. Um, I mean, it might be nicer on a little yacht bobbing about in the waves, but on this cruise ship, and you're up on the top deck, which is, I don't know, 100 feet above the water or something, you've got the rush of the wind from the ship moving through the ocean, and the King spray of the world. and everything. <laughs> yeah, not quite. But it was still a pretty good view of old, uh, old Comet Halley. But anyway, look, I hope I've explained the brightness and magnitude scale... Uh, for you. It's what we get asked about, about a lot. Don't even worry about it if, in terms of going out looking at the night sky. It's something that's nice to know academically and if you want to get into astronomy you'll, you'll soon learn it but don't even worry about getting confused about apparent and absolute magnitudes. It, do, it doesn't really matter when you're going out to look at the night sky. So that's basically what's in the sky during July but Stuart before we go just to preview what's coming up in August. So for listeners in Australia, the Pacific Islands, around Asia, Africa and some of Europe there's going to be a partial eclipse of the moon on the night of August the 7th or the 8th depending on your time zone. So for in Australia, most of Australia is going to occur in the early morning hours of the 8th of August. And of course, these lunar eclipses always happen usually within two weeks, one side or the other of a solar eclipse. They do, yep, yep. There's a solar eclipse coming up as well. So um, this, this lunar eclipse, it's not going to be the biggest and best one we've ever seen, but about a quarter of the moon will go dark as the moon moves through the Earth's shadow. And then you're right, a couple of weeks later, August the 21st is the big one. There's going to be a total eclipse of the sun and it's going to be visible right across the United States. So everyone there is getting pretty excited about it. This will be the first 
total solar eclipse visible from the US mainland since 1979. So there's a whole generation that gone by who've never had a chance to um, to see one of these things or experience it. Australians have been spoiled, haven't they? They've had they've had a couple across the mainland. Yeah, we, we've had a few. We've had, uh, there was one, what, 2012? Uh, I can't remember, 2014. Yeah, that was up at Cairns Way, and there was another the one Cairns, at, uh, yeah. down in the south that went through Sejuna. Yeah, we had Sejuna. We've had a few, actually, so we've been pretty lucky. It would seem to a, an outside observer, if you like, that it's a bit hit and miss where eclipses can be seen from, and, and it it certainly can be, I suppose. There, there is a pattern to it, of course, which you can work out, and that's why they can predict these things a long way ahead. That allowed Albert Einstein to uh, prove his general theory of relativity, of course. During a cycle, yeah, exactly, when the sun was covered up and they could see the stars in the background and f- figure out that some of them seemed to be where they shouldn't be, which meant that the light from them was getting bent as it went past the sun. So, yeah, that was, that was pretty important observation. That, you know, actually, in, when that observation was made, it vindicated his, his theory. 1919 in Kenya, by the way. It was, it was still pretty ho-hum in a way. People didn't, you know, oh, that's interesting here. Yeah, it seems to, seems to, you know, agree with what Einstein said, but even and then the acceptance and the appreciation of what he'd come up with really didn't take off until a little bit later but that was certainly the... Um... There was also the other problem too, because it was happening in Germany in the uh, racism and anti-Semitism that was starting to build up there with people who were just plain you know, racist Nazis there was always this thing that what Einstein was doing was simply Jewish science which wasn't real science from a German or Prussian point of view. Amazing isn't it? Real uh, scientists absolutely. of course like Heisenberg you know, totally rejected those sort of uh, allegations but uh, unfortunately things just got worse, of course, with uh, the rise of Hitler and, uh, and the Nazi party and then World War II. It's quite amazing, isn't it? And um, it makes you think, well, you know, we live in enlightened times, that sort of thing couldn't happen now, could it? Except, I'm sure I read the, just today, in fact, that uh, the, in America, the United States, the head of what, the Environmental Protection Agency is an anti, anti-climate change. A no, climate sceptic. Yeah, 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 actually, I shouldn't call them charge. sceptics. Sceptics uh, imply a um, scientific thought behind rigor, it. Yeah. Yes, whereas uh, what yeah. they are is simply climate change deniers, because usually they're in the pay of multinational oil and uh, fuel companies. No. Dear, oh dear. What's the world coming to? That, that sort of thing. That stuff doesn't go on, does it? Anyway, back, back to uh, eclipses. So August the 21st, big one. Total solar eclipse visible across the US mainland. Now, a solar eclipse, of course, happens when the moon goes between us and the sun, blocking out the sun, and the moon's shadow gets cast upon us down here on Earth. Now, for those in the US lucky enough to be on the central part of the eclipse, or the central path, I should say, you'll see the sun completely covered over. For those in other places you'll experience a partial eclipse. But get this, they've worked out that you know most of the US population in the, in the mainland states are within about an hour or two's drive of the, the central line of the, uh, of the eclipse. So I think there are going to be lots and lots and lots of people uh, having a go to, to get a view of it. And on the Space Time blog, we've actually posted which uh, parts of the uh, path of the eclipse are likely to get the most amount of sunlight and which are likely to be overcast. So there's a further guide there if you want it. Yeah, of course, because uh, weather is very important. Uh, you can go to the best place where you can expect to see the most minutes or seconds of the eclipse, but if the weather's rotten, well, you, you've wasted your time, haven't you? So just finally, solar eclipses are dangerous to look at, of course, so make sure you take all the proper solar precautions, which basically means don't look directly at the sun with or without any sort of optical aid. You can find all the advice you need about uh, how to safety view the eclipse on the Sky and Telescope website. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at spacetimewithstuartgary on Instagram, And on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. (laughs) 
You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.